Okay, everybody, welcome to the Seven Figures Club podcast. Today, my friends, we've got an amazing entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who has built a an organization with literally millions of people in it that he is uh, basically a founding member of it. He has built this, you know, I think it's up to 10 million uh, distributors in his organization globally. His name, Justin Harrison. And in a day and age, now, by the way, some of you didn't know, but I'm actually the oldest of nine kids, but Justin is actually the father of nine sons. He's a success coach. He's an author. He's uh, spent much of his career in the network marketing profession. After, uh, during college, he saw a newspaper ad, he got involved in uh, network marketing, took control of his life, took this big plunge, and he built a large organization only to see it fall and come tumbling down. He, he went with some other companies, didn't see a lot of success, accepted a position at a multi-million dollar international business as the director of sales. You're gonna find out listening to him that he is a master of sales and communication. He does online webinars, YouTube videos. Anyway, he took that job, he enjoyed it. He was doing well, there was a lot of stability. He, he was uh, building his family, so probably it was important to have that stability. But his passion was to teach people about reaching their potential. He loved training. He knew he could be a much more effective trainer if he were free to do it on his own terms and, and was doing it to build his own business and future. And so after seven years in corporate America, he decided that he really did want to get back out in the field. And although it was a massive leap of faith, scary probably for him and his family to leave that security and the benefits and the salary, he you know, joined up on the distributor side and resigned from his position looking for an opportunity. He'd heard news of a new startup company and this is when he became the master founding wellness advocate of doTERRA International, quickly becoming one of their top producers. You probably heard the name doTERRA. It is a global brand and uh, he's built an amazing team. He's become a phenomenal leader and his organization in this old bio had 2 million members in it, which just seems unthinkable. But now, now, Justin, how many, uh, how many team members do you have now? Oh, we're over 10 million globally. There are over 32 million businesses in the U.S. and over 90% of them will never break seven figures in annual sales. So how do we as entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs break into that seven figures club? This podcast will relentlessly share the secrets, strategies, and tactics I've used to create three multi seven figures businesses and bring in even more successful entrepreneurs than me to share their inspirational stories and tactics to success. You can create your dream business in life right now. So buckle up and let's go. Over 10 million globally. That is, we're going to talk a lot about organization and how you manage that. And a lot of it, I'm sure, has to do with leaders that you build in your team and business and delegate out. But let's talk about the launch. What There's a, a lot of people out there listening to this podcast that are aspiring entrepreneurs and they're looking for the right opportunity. And a lot of them know that there's a lot of opportunity in network marketing, but there's also a lot of people that don't succeed. So what gave you the confidence to leave the security of that cushy corporate job and go out and build this network marketing business? <laughs> that is a big question. How much time do we have? Uh, no. <laughs> well, first, thanks, Leo, for the invite uh, to be on the podcast. Uh, super cool of you to do that. So appreciate it very much. Um, you know, for me, the confidence came in in having done it before, right? You mentioned that I was uh, in, in direct sales prior to corporate America. And that's true and had a great run, learned a lot uh, due to no fault of our own, but some ethical choices of the owner of that company, right? The company went away and then you find yourself all of a sudden, okay, now what do I do next? And, and uh, ended up working on the corporate side of a direct sales company uh, for those, uh, those handful of years. And then, yes, got back into the field. And, and, and what really moved me into, um, it was a leap of faith. There's always risk, right? There's always risk in, in our industry, our profession. I do prefer to call it a profession because industry to me is like steel and iron automotive. Uh, and uh, this is a profession mm. if we treat it as such. Like right? profession. So, so I do prefer to refer to our profession as a profession. Um, 
the, the reason that I felt so passionate about getting back into our profession is because I knew it would change lives. And I, I knew that there was a lot of risk. 98% of the new startups in our space fail within two years, right? I mean, it's kind of a joke that, that if, if they're less than two years old, don't go, right? Don't join them if they're less than two years old because they're not going to make it until if, they're, if they make it to the two-year mark, then they might survive, right? That's kind of the, the running joke that's out there. But um, it, there was a lot of risk and a lot of unknowns, uh, but we felt really passionate about our, our abilities and uh, more than anything about the culture of the company that we were establishing and the product, right? We knew the product was going to be incredible, uh, that it was going to change lives. And so it was just a matter of pulling it all together and implementing and running. And so you guys kind of did this as a team. There were a number of founding members that really launched uh, doTERRA. And so how helpful was it kind of seeing the mistakes that some other people had made in previous companies that you've been in? And uh, what sort of things did you guys learn that you were going to, how were you going to do things different, you know, with doTERRA you know, compared to some of the other companies you guys had built? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, yes. So the, the founding executive ownership team of doTERRA uh, is uh, there's seven members of that team, right, uh, that are the corporate owners. And between them, they have about 150 years of experience in all different areas. So mm. super, super valuable, right? Uh, different companies, different expertise, and all of that coming together in one. And, and I did not want to participate on that side of the company, right? That was not my strength. My strength is to be with the field in the field and uh, not on the corporate side. And so um, that's where we chose to, to participate, to play in this game. Uh, but having been in our profession for, gosh, I don't know, 20 years at that point, 15, 20 years, somewhere in there, um, had seen a lot, had experienced a lot, was very competent, particularly in compensation models, right, in our profession. So uh, offered a lot of input into that as we were getting that set up. And um, really playing on that team camaraderie of what's going to be best, right? And what I appreciate about that is they chose to only go with things that were proven. Like there was a lot of great ideas that were thrown out there. I threw out, I, I had some of those ideas. Some of those ideas were mine. I was like, well, this would be great. Let's do this. But because it had never been done and never tried and never documented or proven anywhere else, it was tabled right? It was sidelined because it didn't have a track record. It didn't have a history. So we only chose to run with aspects of our compensation and marketing models that already had a track record, right? So it wasn't a question of if it's going to work, right? We know it's going to work because it's already working. So let's just implement that, right? So I do appreciate that really quite a lot, uh, even though at the time I, was, I had some pretty crazy ideas of my own, uh, which we did not do. But uh, in retrospect, it's probably a good thing. You know what? That is a brilliant point I think that you've just made. So if you're an aspiring entrepreneur, you're a business owner, you're looking to expand a product or start something and you have some experience in the field trying to like recreate the wheel and invent something new in terms of the marketing and products and different uh, compensation structures that have already proven to work can sometimes be a, a really big mistake. And, and I've made that. And then the thing that I kind of liken it to is, you know, People who follow Russell Brunson and, and ClickFunnels know that he talks about funnel hacking. What's the sales product and how do they market whatever it is, whatever business it is. And if you can do something similar that's proven with your own twist, your own better product, better service, better team, then you, your odds for success are much better. Right. That's awesome. Well, perfect. Let's talk a little bit about your background, Justin. So, you know, what was your upbringing like and, and how do you think that uh, affected you or gave you the mindset uh, to become an entrepreneur? At what point throughout your childhood or as you were growing up and, and in college, like what, what was that experience like and, and how do you think that, um, you know, contributed to who you are as an amazing team builder of massive organizations? <clears throat> wow. Um, so my, I grew up in Eastern Idaho and my father was a police officer and his father was a police officer. And, uh, I, I saw enough to know I didn't want to do that. <laughs> right. Uh, holding all the admiration and respect for those, those, uh, positions, those careers. Right. Yeah. Um, the closest that I got was to be a lifeguard. 
<laughs> That's the closest I got to law enforcement, right? Um, but what I did have instilled in me at a very young age from my parents was their spirit of entrepreneurship. Um, they were always engaged in side hustles, right? So yes, my father had his police career, uh, but there was always other things, right, that the family was doing to generate income. It's funny, if you remember back to the uh, Jeff Foxworthy joke, if your life's ambition is to own and operate firework stands, you might be a redneck. Well, that was my family. <laughs> hey, so, there's some great firework that, spots up there in that, Eastern that, Idaho. That's right. That, and, and to this day, my parents actually still do firework stands up there. Um, and so it's been a great little thing for them. Uh, but, but always having that exposure. And then anytime I kind of got the uh, nicknamed the neighborhood salesman, because when we do like the fundraising thing as kids, remember when they'd have us like sell the candy Go door to door and yeah, yeah they would they have, have a little like, contest at school. Yeah. And, yeah. They'd have us hawk all the little trinkets and what, you know, whatever. I mean, uh, everything they'd throw at us. Right. Uh, I always did those, right. I always did those and always loved that. And uh, I think people would buy from me just because they felt bad, but uh, it doesn't matter to me. They would. And my mother was my own best chocolate customer because I'd just leave a box of chocolates in the freezer and she'd eat them all. And then she'd have to buy them. Have to have fun. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So, so they were always doing something and that spirit just kind of stuck with me. And then um, as, I, as I got into college, uh, I always intended to own and operate a business of some kind. I did not know it would be in our profession in direct sales. Uh, I had no idea what direct sales even was. I, I was a total clueless to the whole concept, never heard of it, uh, zero experience. But when I answered that ad that you mentioned in your introduction and uh, sat with some folks and they explained to me the concept of, of earning a small percentage off of hundreds or thousands of people, versus 100% of one being yourself, right? I mean, that really hit me hard as a kind of a, a duh moment. Um, so I can earn a little tiny percent off of many or 100% of me. Hmm, you know, uh, do the math. So that was it. That's, that's all it took for, for me to have my mind open to the potential and possibility and it kind of uh, consumed me from that point on, so. Oh. Perfect. So, so the upbringing, you know, you're the guy going door to door, uh, that funny kid in the neighborhood is always selling something. You're at your parents' uh, fireworks stands, utilizing sales skills there, learning to communicate well with people and probably yeah. dealing with a lot of different people and, and how to interact with them and, and solve whatever their need or, or problem is. So I think that's a great uh, point that we should all understand. If we have children, we want them to be entrepreneurial and successful getting them involved in those things, especially with the family business. I think that's that's awesome. But you you just brought up a really important point that I think a lot of people struggle with when they're first getting starting. A am I going to be a solopreneur or an entrepreneur? And kind of understanding that dynamic before you begin, that's a major aha moment that you just talked about. And, and so as you assess that, like what are what should someone be aware of if they're looking at a different opportunity? What opportunity is going to be more conducive to allowing you to build that organization? Because there's so much power in an organization. And if it's just you, you're going to be limited. So what should you look for with the right opportunity there? That's, a, that's an awesome question, actually. So uh, you have to look for scalability, right? And yeah. for, du for duplication. So if there's so many great opportunities out there, right? Great business opportunities all over the place. There's really no shortage of them um, in, in every field and every concept you can think of. Um, and, and you have to look at a few different things. First is your product unique, right? Is the product unique? If it is not unique, you're going to struggle. Uh, if it's something that they can get anywhere else, then man, that's a hard, that's a hard place to be, right? So, so that's one question. Is it consumable? Is your product consumable? Um, if it isn't, you know, like I looked at a great company once that had a great product, but literally you would buy it and it had a 90 year life cycle. Ugh. Like, so, so, so there's no repeat business, right? I mean, it's like they buy it and they're good for all of the rest of their life. And so you're constantly having to go out and get new business, right? Because there's no repeat business. 
And so that, that's not necessarily bad, but that makes it harder. So it needs to be consumable. It needs to be unique. And then there needs to be something about its story that moves people emotionally, right? It moves people emotionally, whatever that foundational story is. And so all of that's important. Coming back to your question, um, if, if you don't have, dupl we call it duplication in our profession, right? Which is the ability for someone else to just do exactly what you've done following a system um, and create similar or maybe even better results, right? If, if it doesn't duplicate, then what you have is you've created for yourself a job, right? You might be the owner, you might be the boss, you might be, uh, you might be the whole company, right? It might just be all, just you. Uh, and, and you will probably start that way. Most of us start that way with just you. But if it stays that way, you've just created for yourself a job and you're probably working um, what's that joke? 80 hours a week. <laughs> yeah. That, what, how do you know an entrepreneur? It's someone that'll work 80 hours a week for themselves before they'll work 40 hours a week for someone else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's kind of true actually. Um, but if you can't get, if you can't bring in that duplication model and have people start to take over critical aspects of your business, because really your job as a business owner should be to work yourself out of a job. Right. It doesn't matter what profession it is. Ultimately, the goal should be that you have others in place, that the whole machine is running smoothly, even if you're not there. Right. Once that's happened, you've achieved duplication and, and you're going to be able to have the lifestyle that you're hoping to have. Right. Otherwise, it, it's a it's a glorified job. It's exactly right. And so a lot of us struggle with that. And so what are some of those keys to success to build leaders and systems and duplication to be able to, to grow and scale like that? Because you can have a great product, you can have this, but what is that leadership like? Because something that you must be phenomenal at and is evidenced by the organization you've built is your ability to lead other people and, and duplicate processes and systems. So, so when you're first getting started and you were the solopreneur and now you've hired a few people or you're starting to build your team, like now how do you really grow and expand and duplicate and, and, and scale like that? Like, what is that? What were those, what are those keys to success? You've been doing this a long time. <laughs> I think that the, probably the biggest realization that I ever experienced in this aspect of our business is that systems duplicate people don't right systems duplicate people don't for example um i and and i say this with all the humility that i have right uh, i am not duplicatable right people will never do the business exactly the way i do the business because it's me right and that can be said for any other person on my team out of the 10 million people right every one of us is unique and they should capitalize on that uniqueness and work the business in their way, right? So none of us can duplicate each other in who we are and how we work. What does duplicate is systems, right? Having a process in place, a guideline, if you will, a roadmap, right? Um, we, we call ours PIPES. It stands for prepare, invite, present, enroll, support. Um, it's, that's the process, right? And then repeat. And it, it works beautifully and, and simple is freedom. Simple duplicates. So if you can keep things as simple as possible and human, and that is hard, by the way, Leo, that is hard. That is very hard. I'm just thinking that's something I've got yeah. to do way better at. Uh, Einstein even referenced that. He, I don't remember his exact quote, but he talked about how it's easy to complicate things, but the real genius is to simplify things, right? And it is human nature because we, we can take – very simple things and, and blow them up and make them all complicated and crazy. I mean, just look at government, right? Okay, we don't even oh, need yeah. to go there. We don't even need to go there. But <laughs> I mean, that's a good example, right? Great that's example. example. Very complicated. Yeah, it's a great example. So, so if, we can, if we can fight that battle of keeping things simple so that they will duplicate, then your leaders emerge, right? Yes. Your leaders emerge because they've embraced the system and they're out sharing it. And one big thing in our leadership team, and we've been so blessed, I, I can't even tell you, beyond measure with phenomenal leaders. Um, I get asked the question sometimes, how do you manage millions of people? I don't. I don't. I, I work with a few dozen people on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, that's really it. A few dozen. 
And, but then they have their people and they have their people and they have their people. Right. And so, and, and that's the beauty of it. Right. I don't micromanage any of these guys, but one thing I have learned is that not everybody wants to be a leader. Oh yeah. Not everybody wants to. And, and sometimes for those of us that are leaders, sometimes we have a hard time with that because, because we just believe everybody wants to be a leader, right? Of course, of course, everybody wants to be a leader. Why wouldn't they? Well, for about 80% of the population, uh, they actually do not. <laughs> they actually do not want to be the leader. Uh, they are very comfortable and very happy uh, following a leader, right? And so sometimes we get into a space where we push someone into a leadership role and they don't want it. And they're not ready for it. And it backfires on us. And so we just need to be very aware that we're working with people that are committed and that are capable to being in a leadership role. And if they're not, it's okay, right? It's okay. Everyone's on their own journey. And so uh, we, we embrace them where they are and let them grow where they are, right? Uh, but, but again, going back, if we can keep it simple and duplicatable, we're going to win. Absolutely. So as you, how do you create, what's the process of creating training that's simple that teaches that system that helps the team succeed. What, what do you think some of those keys are or have been for you guys to, to build out the, the training? Because you can have the system, it can be simple. Now, how do we train people? What, what does that look like? Well, I, I will admit that it was not easy. And we have some brilliant, brilliant minds yeah. that really pulled a lot of weight on this. But you know, it's interesting when you get a lot of chiefs in a room, there's a lot of different ideas. Hmm. Um, we had uh, many experiences with lots of different people and different opinions on how things should be done, right? And um, there, there was, there was some <laughs> very interesting conversations, um, but yet we're all able to come to a conclusion at the end and agree on principles. Okay, and mm. that, that, that's the key. Mm. So even with all these diverse leadership styles and all these different people, um, we're not going to go out and teach someone the exact, like you have to say it this way, you have to do it that way, because that's not true. There's many ways you could do it, right? But the principles are universal, right? The principles are universal. And so you teach those, you teach those values, and then let them add their own frosting to the cake, if you will, right? Their own flair, their own style, and um, you know, their own way of doing things. And so it, 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 was, it was a chore, I'll be honest, it was a chore um, when you try and get everyone on the same page, especially in a company that's, uh, we, we didn't actually implement a company-wide training system until about year number eight, hmm. right? And up until that point, um, there was many different training systems out there running and all of them were great. And some of them, you know, would appeal to one type of person and other to others. And it took some time to get everyone kind of wrapped in on the same page, if you will. Um, but uh, that boy, is it magical. So uh, we just start out, we, we have it all laid out, a simple progression. We have it all printed out in different guides uh, for each rank, each title, and different responsibilities, different activities. Always, always making sure people know that this is the, the guidepost, right? But be you. That's the most important thing to me, I think, because people can tell if you're not sincere. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, for example, some, some of our tools have scripts. Some people love scripts. You know, tell me exactly what to say, and I'll say it exactly like that. And other people, I'm one of those, hate scripts. I hate scripts. Uh, I, I just need a bullet point or two or three, and that's it. Right? And then let me fill in the blanks. And that's just how I'm wired. <clears throat> Both are right. Right? Both are right. It just depends on the person, you know, what works for them. And so we leave that liberty intact for people to, to do it how they feel comfortable, right? Build in their way. And uh, while providing the guideposts and the values along the way to keep them on track. Good stuff, Justin. So create that training. There's, there's courses, there's training material, but it's not completely rigid set in stone. It's based upon the principles and the values, and then there are multiple solutions to present the offer and, and explain the product and, and exactly. resolve people's concerns with who you are because authenticity is everything today. 
Yeah. And, and one thing this leads to Leo that I would say is, uh, our secret sauce. Um, cause a lot of people would say, well, you're an essential oil company, so yeah. it must be because of the oils. Right. And don't get me wrong. The oils Great are product, amazing freaking product. awesome. And they do amazing things and they're, they're the best quality out there. Um, the process that we go through is insanely crazy to, to make mm. sure that's the case. Uh, but the oils are not our secret sauce and that might catch some people off guard, but they're really not our secret sauce really is our culture. Mm. It's our culture. It's the community that we've created because in direct sales, traditionally our profession has had kind of a love them and leave them uh, mentality associated to it, which is unfortunate. But, but oftentimes true, right? People would get someone in and once they're in, they move on there and they move on to the next person. And it just leaves a wake of dead bodies in, in their path. And uh, we don't operate like that. We focus on education. We focus on teaching. We focus on customer acquisition. Um, it's not just get in, get their money, move on to the next person, build a business, make a lot of money, bling, bling. Uh, we're not into the bling. People are pretty... People that come from other direct sales companies, when they when they come into DoTerra, they're actually somewhat cut off, cut off guard because they're like, well, where are the people with you know getting the cars and the boats and the mansions and the and the jewelry? We call those people the gold chainers. Um, they don't see that here, and it isn't that we don't have people that could have all of that because we do. We have lots, uh, but that's not our focus, right? We uh, our our focus is not on the bling and on the lifestyle. Um, it is on helping people, right? It's supporting people, helping people get out of debt. We actually have a crazy goal uh, that we want to be the largest. We want to be responsible, the number one company in the world for helping more people get out of debt than any other company. I right? love that. So that's, that's almost a mission statement for doTERRA and its yeah. uh, distributors and the organization. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, I mean, if you get, if people can get out of debt, it changes everything. For sure. It's a, it's a big uh, burden lifted off of their shoulders. Right. So you, you talked a lot about this culture. That's the, that's the secret sauce. That's what's given doTERRA right. such amazing growth and, and success. Mm -hmm. And so for someone looking to build that culture within their team, within a team organization at doTERRA or their startup, or they're looking to stop operating uh, 80 hours a week as a solopreneur and actually build that team. So we've talked about the, the training, that's important. So I think maybe the next thing that, that maybe you can teach us is the values and the principles that create that culture. What are the keys to defining those and, and how do you kind of police or inspire the whole group to want to follow that culture? I, I think uh, if you're just starting, the people that you start with will set the culture. Um, we were really fortunate to have from, from top down, corporate and in the field, the people that we began with in the very beginning were did literally defenders of our culture. Uh, we, we, some, some of us even called ourselves that, <laughs> right? Uh, being, meaning that we were very aware if a bad apple showed up, and occasionally one does, right? This, happens, sure. this happens in every business, guys, every business, uh, every organization. And being mindful of when, you know, a bad actor or bad apple is in the barrel. And you know what a rotten apple does in the barrel, right? It ruins all Spoils the others. everybody, you know. Spoils all of them. So, so helping them see that they either had to evolve and change or move on, right? Hmm. And, and gratefully, that would happen uh, naturally most of the time. Uh, they would not be comfortable in our culture, right? Uh, a heavy focus on family values, a heavy focus on education. Um, and some fo for some, that meant their business would grow slower than they liked, right? Because it wasn't hyped, it, but it was authentic. And uh, a lot of these hype organizations that have been out there, uh, like I had a guy call me once we were a year into doTERRA things were going great, but you know, it, lots of challenges, of course, but still sure. going great. And uh, he called me up and he said, well, if you're not making $20,000 a month yet, if you're not making $20,000 a month after six months, you're wasting your time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, 
six months, um, that's going to, if you're doing that, it's probably not legal. <laughs> okay. I mean, there, there are so many red flags to me when someone says that, because um, that, that falls into like the Ponzi scheme type of scenarios, right? For when sure. That, and and we've that, seen those. We've yeah. seen those for sure. Yeah. Yeah. When that kind of money's being thrown around in that short amount of time, it's like, okay, question, question that. Right. Um, and, and not to say that kind of income isn't possible, but it isn't probable, right? If you're doing it right, not in that short window, it takes time to build up. It takes time to build up. And, and for some, they didn't like that, you know, about our culture that, yeah, you're, you can have those income levels and more, but you're going to earn it. Right. And it's going to take some time, but it's going to be super solid and very legitimate and lifelong lasting, right? It's going to be there for you and your kids. Sounds like real success because yeah, I've seen yeah. a lot of those companies where they do well, they shoot up and then they come crashing down very, very Gone. quickly yeah. and, and yeah. there's no stability there. It's a just short-term planning and not in it for the long term. Right. And that's a, that's a huge problem. Now, one thing you really defined well for us is foundation. If you want to build an amazing culture, it takes a foundation of the first few people on your team and then it, it obviously takes removing those bad apples, especially at the beginning and policing that culture, because if you don't, you can lose it very, very quickly at the beginning. Yeah. John Maxwell says, uh, and you know, John Maxwell is a phenomenal author. He's written more books on leadership than any other human in the history of the world. Right. And uh, one of his, one of my favorite quotes of his, because uh, we talk about vision all the time. What's your vision, right? Mm. Um and one of my favorite quotes of his is culture eats vision for lunch every time. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, That's your vision good. is great. You have a big vision, but if the culture is going sour, the vision yeah. will never happen. Vision is irrelevant if the culture isn't there. So what are the keys to being a great leader when you're first starting out and versus when you build a massive organization like you do, for, for you, you, you say, all right, I'm, I'm dealing with, you know, the leaders that I built. So how do, how do we lead leaders? Mm, that's great. Oh, we could, we could probably talk for hours on this topic. Um, start by listening. Mm. Right. And that's a, that's kind of a lost art. <laughs> In today's world, I think it's a big time lost art. Uh, lots of yelling, very little listening. Um, so I, I would start there, right? And, and really showing, showing sincere, genuine interest in, in others and what they have to say. And then first and, for, first and foremost, by far, you have to lead yourself, right? You, you have to lead yourself first. Um, you cannot lead others where you haven't been. That's called being a travel agent. <laughs> travel agents send people all over the world to places that most of them have never been. I've never been, yeah. <laughs> right? You've never been there, right? And once in a while, you'll find an agent that's been to a few of those places. But, but you can't be a travel agent leader telling people where to go if you haven't been there, right? It's, uh, it's, it doesn't work. They sense it and lack sincerity. So you've got to start by leading yourself and leading with integrity, doing what you say, meaning what you say, right? Following through on your promises. Uh, if anything, under promise and over deliver is always a safe bet, Right recognition oh my goodness recognition it's one of the human needs right it's one of our human needs for for survival really for thriving um recognizing your team members for their accomplishments and, and really for almost anything anything you want to recognize it for it builds this amazing relationship um, not, and i'm not talking about flattery right flattery lacks sincerity but um recognizing them for their accomplishments and in today's age, it doesn't have to cost any money. It can be a social media post. It can be a text. It can be a quick phone call. Uh, yeah, you could drop them a, a gift card. You can, I mean, there are things you could do. There's so many things. But it does tremendous things for them. Mary Kay Ash, who is the, the founder of Mary Kay, right? Direct sales company, very successful. Um, she, and she's passed away now, right? But she's very well known for making the statement that when someone enters the room, you need to look at them as if they're wearing a sign around their neck that says, make me feel important. And imagine what would happen if we all saw that sign, like, okay, what can I say to Sally? What can I say to Rob? 
that will make them feel important, right? It's life-changing, right? It's life-changing. So, so many different um, aspects of leadership that we could talk about. Um, not micromanaging is another one that's important. Uh, allowing people to, to blossom, to bloom where they're planted, right, is important. Sounds like you're a servant leader. And I, I think we've all read some of those different books about servant leadership. But when you serve others on the team and other leaders, it, sh it gives them the right uh, pathway to, to inspire people. Because leadership is, there's a big part of it that's inspiring people. You, you talked about recognizing them. Yeah. You talked about instead of just telling them everything, asking them the right questions. What are some of those questions maybe you ask uh, your leaders to help them achieve the goals they're looking to achieve? Ooh, number one question is what are they reading? I love it. What are they reading? Uh, what are they reading? Yes, because this is critical and you can see behind me a portion of my library up yeah. there. It's only a small part of it it's on this other wall as well and at home. Um, what we read, I mean, we're, we're surrounded by so much negativity, right? It's like, oh man, just negative, negative. The world by and large is negative. Turn on the news is negative, negative. Occasionally, the weather's positive. Uh, occasionally. If you live in Utah, that's rare. But <laughs> <laughs> however, yesterday was very nice. Uh, but uh, it was. So, so we're bombarded with so much negativity that we have to combat it. And to successfully lead and to successfully be an entrepreneur in general, um, you are going to have to pull the weeds. You're going to have to demuck your mind, mm -hmm. right? You got to pull the weeds out because just like real weeds – that can thrive everywhere. They, they grow in the cracks in the sidewalk, right? I mean, they, they grow everywhere. It's the same thing in our brains, right? We get these mind viruses that take hold. And if we don't, if we don't pay attention, if we're not careful, they, they grow and they overwhelm our, our minds. And we've, we switch from positive to negative. And, and the only real way to combat, combat that, I feel, is through what we're feeding our minds, either reading, audiobooks, Right. There's some there's some phenomenal books that the audio books I like even more. Yeah, right? me too. I mean, they're great. They're great. I do really love to read like I actually won't read like I could pull any number of these books down and, and show you um, if, if I don't have a pen. I won't read a book because I have to circle, underline notes. Right. I, I can't do an e-reader. I can't do electronic books. I know a lot of people do that. And I know you can take notes in them and whatnot, but I guess I'm old fashioned, right? I, I want the paper. Uh, I want to be able to, to underline and circle and make notes. And then when I'm having a particular call or webinar or talking to the group about a certain topic, I can pull that book out. It's already annotated. Mm -hmm. It's already got all of everything in there. I don't have to reread the whole thing, right? I can just take what I've already circled and underlined and made in my own. And I've got my content ready for me, right? So... And so highly recommend 20 to 30 minutes a day in personal development. More is great, but I'll, I'll take even 15 minutes nowadays is, uh, is great. Um, more of an audio book, but, but to move forward as an entrepreneur uh, or to steal a term from Dave Ramsey and entree leader, because <laughs> he's merged entrepreneur and leader together. Cause really that's what you are. Right. So he calls them entree leaders. Um, you have to invest in, in you. In your Best mind. investment you can make. Oh man, and, and and I've invested thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in courses, in uh, books, in programs, and materials. It it's a, it's a never ending journey. You don't just arrive. In fact, if you ever think you're through learning, you're through. Oh, absolutely, you're done. <laughs> you're you're just done, right? It's just never going to stop, and it shouldn't because it's a, it's a journey. It's not a destination, right? And so. Um, I, that's my favorite part, honestly, about our business. Yes. I love what the product does for people. Um, yes. I love seeing people's lives change health wise and financially, but mostly I love seeing their mindset change. Mm. The power yeah. of changing the mind, the principles and the values is what lead to success. That's why you could take everything away from certain people and because of the values and principles and what they're feeding their mind with, they'll become successful very quickly again. Yeah. Yep. So, Justin, if somebody's looking at the profession of direct selling and uh, wants to take a, a good look at that and, and maybe even interested in working with you and, and your team and organization, you know, what's the best pathway for them to follow? 
Uh, I'm a huge fan of our profession, as you can imagine. Um, I'm, I'm part of the mastermind faculty, uh, which is a group of professional network marketers that meets each year from lots of different companies, like dozens and dozens. I think we we're over 60 companies last year. Wow. And, um, and we come together once a year and share our best practices and things that are working. And, and we do it in a way that's, it's amazing actually, right? It's, it's safe. No one's trying to get people to jump companies or anything like that. Or you should come work with me or you should go work with him. None of that happens. It's just a mutual, uh, it's a rising tide floats all boats, right? Mm -hmm. So, so there's a, a lot of amazing companies out there. Obviously I'm going to be partial to my own, of course. Uh, but my, my number one recommendation to anyone looking at our profession to supplement their income or replace their income is you need to find a culture, right? A company culture that fits you, right? And a product that resonates with you, okay? Um, it, it has to be a product. You know, I, I was offered an opportunity many years ago, many years ago with a, a startup company and uh, their product was coffee. Mm. And they had this unique process and, and this, this mushroom thing they were going to do to the coffee and, and I consulted with them for a while and helped them develop a compensation model and all of that stuff. And, and they wanted to offer me the top position. And I, and I just said, you know, I, I don't drink coffee. <laughs> so I, I, I can't take your position. I, I just can't. And they're like, well, you don't have to use the product. And I was like, oh, I, yeah. Going to be uh, tough to really be passionate yeah. and all in if I'm not a product of the product. I'm like, I'm like, you just told me I don't have to use your product to represent your product. I'm like, I'm out. Dang, Justin. They knew you were that good and you're going to make out. that big of an impact for them. <laughs> I'm out. But like, you're right. I mean, it would have been doomed from the beginning. You have to be passionate. You have to believe in what you're doing and making ah. a difference or everyone's going to realize it. Well, and the product or the purpose of the company or both, ideally, yeah. have to move you at an emotional level, mm. okay, at, at, a, at a heart level, right? If, if they don't, because like I said, there's a lot of ways to go out and make money, right? There's just, so many. there's jobs all over and, and you can go, you can Uber, you know, you can go drive Uber or do so many different things. Um, and they're great companies and great services. But if it, if it's just a job to you to make, you know, 15, 20 bucks an hour and get by, if that's all it is, then this isn't for you, right? And this profession is not for you. Uh, if you're looking for something that you can really be passionate about, um, you need to find something, right? Find a product that moves you. Um, I've been using essential oils for 25 years, right? doTERRA is only 12 years old. So I have 12 years using essential oils before doTERRA, right? So I knew the power and, and blessing and benefit of the oils to the human family. So for me to get passionate about it was real easy, right? It was already there was already there. So, so of course it made sense for me. Um, likewise, if you're looking in this space, you need to find a product that moves you, right? That moves you. And then a company that has a track record of integrity and uh, doing what they say they do, right? And really keeping their nose clean. Because unfortunately in our profession, there are some bad players, <laughs> I guess you could say, um, some less honest players, right? So you do need to be a little sure. bit Right? You need to be a little bit careful, do your homework, um, read the reviews, talk to people, right? Talk to others in the profession. That's the best way to find out um, how, how, uh, how ethical an organization might be. So, Well, I think the top value that you bring up, and I, we've got it on the wall in our office, is we do what we say we're going to do. And boy, if you can do that, I think you automatically rise to the top 10% of businesses and business professionals out there because so many people do not abide by that value. Oh man. It's, it's pretty crazy. It's unfortunate. It, it really is. But uh, yeah. You know what else you mentioned there that I thought was impactful is you've been in the essential oils profession for 25 years. And I think nowadays people are so quick to when something's difficult or it doesn't go right as they plan. They, they change, they change, and they're constantly changing, you know, profession every other year. And the problem with doing that is you never are able to gain long-term momentum and long-term credibility. But when somebody comes back to you five, 10 years later, and you're still in the same profession, 
and you really believe in it and you serve your clients and your partners and your community, I mean, that, I think that's a big seven figure secret that a lot of people miss. Oh, definitely critical. Well, Justin, it has been amazing uh, spending uh, this time with you and learning so much about leadership, building organizations with millions of people in it. So much value that you brought. What else can we as a community do to serve you and, and give back to everything? Where can we connect with you? How's the best way that we can help Justin and the organization that you built? Love what you're doing, Leo. Absolutely love it. Um, Facebook's probably the easiest, just uh, at doTERRA Justin. Okay. Is my At doTERRA Justin, we'll, we'll yeah. post this uh, below here in YouTube and on the post, guys, so that everybody uh, can connect uh, yeah, with my, Justin. Uh, I'm pretty sure my email, and he, I think even my cell phone is there. Don't abuse it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> happy right. to help out, happy to counsel, give direction, uh, whatever, whatever is needed. So appreciate your efforts, Leo, and everything you guys are doing. It's a great concept, great podcast. Awesome. Well, well thank, thanks so much, Justin. Have an amazing day. And everybody, we will see you next time on the Seven Figures Club podcast. Are you looking for more Seven Figure Secrets content or even how you can launch your own recession proof business? Then check out sevenfigures.com. That's the digit seven, F I G U R E S.com, where we share more videos, stories, strategies funding solutions, entrepreneurial education, and even the secret business type that's recession-proof. Thank you for listening, and if you're finding value in our podcast, please give us a five-star and invite others to join the club.